My name is Lee Kapili. I'm going to be talking today about extending Kubernetes in more secure ways. So today's talk is for controller builders. It's for people who want to create projects that allow people to use the Kubernetes ecosystem with new schemas, new tools, and integrations. And um, yeah, I'm from Colorado. Uh, if anyone is totally just not connecting with Kubernetes impersonation mechanisms and auth, this is a picture of my dog, so like that's valuable, and you can take that away. I'm a Filipino-American, so if you speak Tagalog, hit me up. Uh, I have been contributing to the Kubernetes space, and I'm all about GitOps, right? I come from a place of operating container workloads and cloud workloads back from the puppet kind of era in telcos and with, you know, uh, data centers of computers. We're infrastructure engineers. We got to glue stuff together, and it's kind of hard to collaborate on stuff sometimes. Right? And so GitOps for me, when I use Kubernetes, it helps me tell that story with my team. Right? It helps me understand the, the versions and the changes of my config over time with my, my uh, clusters. And so uh, that's why Kubernetes and GitOps are valuable to me. And so working with the Flux team, because uh, I had the privilege of working with the awesome folks at Weaveworks, uh, we started to kind of refactor things. And now we have Flux2. Right? There are a lot of Flux2 users, uh, even in this room. Uh, project just keeps going because people are looking to get organized with Kubernetes. It's one of the biggest problems that you have when you want to start using these distributed computers. And um, I'm on the Tanzu team. Uh, so I want to be talking about something that we discovered as we started factoring out Flux into lots of controllers with lots of objects. And it's about building multi-tenant APIs. You see. When we start collaborating with each other, we start using the distributed computers, we're not just like logging into our laptop anymore, right? We need to know about identity. We need to know about roles and access. And so the GitOps problem is actually the problem of like, how do we work with each other? Right? And working with each other, it's very important to know who people are, what they have access to. And there's some interesting things happening with identity when we do GitOps and Kubernetes. And so we had this need for multi-tenant APIs. See, because say you have a controller, right? a very simple one, say something like the deployment controller. It manages deployment objects and replica sets. And then the replica set controller is also making pods and like moving things around for you. All right, so you got like these two different API kinds, and then maybe they have some sub objects. All right, so you're in the control loop. And it's like, okay, I'm going to work on this object. It has this specification and produce these objects. All right, so you have you're changing one API, and then the controller on your behalf, because of the declaration, will imperatively change other APIs. You see, well, in the GitOps land, it's not as simple of a picture, right? We had the same topology, but now we maybe have even more different kinds. Right? We might have like webhook configurations, we might have sources, we might have different kinds for applies. And then those objects, especially the applier, it's not just operating on a fixed set of things because the applier is hooked up to some source that has configs about all different API objects. But then you might have an applier that's just for your app, it's just modifying a deployment and a service in a namespace. And then you might have an applier that's applying custom resource definitions, it's changing the cluster, it's modifying secrets management, it's doing all these really low-level things. And so these completely different ideas of privilege just based off of changing the specification of the object. Right now you're affecting all these other APIs in the control loop contextually for just one request. But then the next request, you might need to drop down to a much lower level of privilege all of a sudden. We have this need for multi-tenancy. And so it's, it's not even that simple because I haven't even in, been talking about namespaces. You see, the applier object, right? Say you do a Helm install. Say you do a cap control deploy. Say you uh, want to you know, apply a bunch of stuff from your JSON app build. You have the applier resource living in the cluster, and then maybe it pulls in some configs from your repository. And then those configs actually apply to other namespaces. So now we're not even just talking about an object affecting multiple object APIs. But then you also are affecting all of these different namespaces, right? This is like, there's many different slices of access that are being played with here. And so we want to really tie in, the first primitive need is that applier needs to have an identity, right? And you can apply this, to, you, you can use this concept with any complex object that you're trying to reconcile in your control loop if you're building an extension. 
right? So then what's kind of happened is, okay, well, we have this need. And normally when we think of having to restrict access or open up access to the Kubernetes API from some place inside the cluster, we reach for a service account. Because right, this is just like, this is what we know. And so extension authors, you know, the Argo project, even Flux, uh, Cap Controller, uh, these GitOps tools, they're like, okay, well, let's give people the ability to, when they're reconciling their Git repo, let's restrict them to a particular service account. Sounds like a good idea, right? And maybe we can do that by just giving the controller access to every single secret in the cluster. And then the controller can just pretty promise to go and fetch that token and then be that user for the purpose of reconciling that object. So there's almost like pseudo access or maybe even dropping a privilege in, in Linux. Now, there's some problems with this, and the, I, just, I really want to point out that service accounts aren't meant for a control loop to reconcile one object. They're meant for pods. There's actually a bunch of extra stuff built on top of service accounts in Kubernetes that are for pods, right? We build these token secrets inside of um, like every namespace where the service accounts are, and then you can just like go and fetch those things, and uh, then the pod references the service account and automatically mounts that secret. Uh, that's the old way of doing this. Uh, we're actually deprecating this in Kubernetes 124, which is just released. So if you're depending on this, like we were in Cap Controller, you have to change your code uh, as an uh, extension author. Uh, the feature gate for that is called Legacy Service Account Token No Auto Generation. So it's enabled by default. Um, the new way that it's done is there's the Token Request API, and this is really something that's only built for the kubelet or kubelet-like things. Uh, not to say that you couldn't use this in a controller, but the problem is that if you're using service accounts, pods are meant to use them. And if you are trying to have a privileged identity, say you have an applier in some namespace and you want to apply some config to that namespace, there's now a service account in that namespace and any pod that ends up in that namespace can assume the service account. And that privilege escalation mechanism is just not desirable. And so that's my main argument for why we should just not be doing this at all. Um, and the only mitigation there is then if you want your applier object to change config and say create pods in the cluster, you actually want it to apply to a different namespace. Um, all of this stuff is written up in detail in a proposal that I'll link at, at the end of the uh, uh, presentation. And uh, that proposal is something that I've honestly spent probably the better part of a year and a half on as well as a bunch of other folks collaborating. So I'll go and give it a read. Um, so what do we do then, right? If we're not supposed to do this, then maybe what are some good ways of, of handling this problem? And there is a mechanism that maybe not a lot of folks know about, or maybe you only know about it in the context of debugging as an administrator. It's called user impersonation. If you talk to the API server with some special headers and you have the permission to do so, you can either impersonate any user in the cluster or a restricted set of resource names or all of the service accounts. And um, so if we then take this mechanism and we say that all of our controllers can impersonate these users, then we can start to create a schema of access, these applier identities that we need. And so instead of, uh, one thing to know about service accounts is that they're actually just users which a with a bunch of extra stuff on it. Like, a service account is not some special identity inside of the Kubernetes API. Once the, the pod has used its special token with all those extra mechanisms, it's just seen as the API server by this special string. So it's system, service account, namespace, name. And then say if we wanted to copy this mechanism by like making more namespace users, we could have the flux controllers say flux user namespace name. Right, Or we could even use the system prefix, but this is reserved. Um, service accounts also have groups. Not a lot of people know this because nobody binds to them like ever. If you search for this on GitHub, there's like no config. Um, if you are doing this, talk to me. I'm, I want to know your use cases. But um, so instead of doing system service accounts, the group and system service accounts namespace, we can just also do that for our users. And um, I, let's, uh, let's actually do a little bit of a demo. I want to kind of uh, show off some things here. So, if we say, I, I'm on a kind cluster and I'm the administrator, right? So I can do kubectl get pods, right? Similarly, uh, get service, right? So there's a resource there, I have access to it. Now, if I wanna do like kubectl get service 
as nobody. This is using impersonation, right? So here we're seeing now uh, error from the API server, services is forbidden, the user, nobody, cannot list the resources in that API group, right? Now, um, I wanna show you a fun behavior, right? So say I have a fake service account, right? Because service accounts are just uh, names. I have to fix that actually. It is system service account. Default is the namespace that I'm in, and then fake SA. All right, so I don't have access as fake SA. If I get the list of service accounts, there's nothing there. If I do a k create, I wrote this earlier. So I'm gonna roll bind. Uh, name it, fake SA, this doesn't matter. And then the cluster role is admin. I'm gonna role bind as administrator into this namespace, uh, the service account in the default namespace. Okay, now let's try to get those pods again. Or was it, uh, it was service. So kubectl get service as system service account default fake SA. Oh, it works. Right, so there's nothing special about service accounts, right? It's literally just a specially formatted string. It's a username. And in the same way, if we want these same sorts of namespaced features with access, we can do that with other names that are well formatted. Now, the problem with using these service account names is that pods like to use those things, and there's the privilege escalation mechanism, so we don't want to do that. Um, the other thing here is uh, just to kind of prove that you can actually impersonate real service accounts, which is what we do in Flux today. Uh, I can like impersonate the Flux system service account for core DNS. I don't have access with core DNS, but if I access the service controller, uh, in the namespace default service account, did I misspell this service as, literally just did this. Oh, it's the wrong namespace. Sorry, kube system not Flux system. So core DNS uh, can actually access the services there. And then uh, the service controller can as well, if I can spell it right. But then I think something like the deployment controller, I don't know if this can access, yeah. So the deployment controller cannot access services, right? And so this user impersonation mechanism is really powerful in that way. Um, cool. So this is within a single cluster, but we're in a multi-cluster world. Should take my time here. We're in a multi-cluster world. And so we don't just need to know and solve the identity problem working within our namespaces and with our team, but with Flux, we actually have the ability to manage other clusters. And so then how does Flux have the ability to do that? And the first thing that you might reach for is kubeconfigs. Now, um, if we kind of follow, there's a trick that's used inside of cluster API. If you store kubeconfigs in a secret next to your cluster definitions, cluster API will go and make that cluster, and then it will put the kubeconfig that it created from that cluster into a secret, and then you can use that to do like these cluster apply sets. Um, so you can apply configurations using cluster API to the thing that you just made. And a GitOps operator like Flux or Argo can go and grab these secrets and do the exact same thing. Right, so we're running a, a workload inside the cluster, our reconcile loop can grab the configs from the applier thing, use the kubeconfig to talk outside the cluster to the other one. And so then once we're talking to the cluster, we can still do all of these things with user impersonation. Right? But now we're impersonating users in the target cluster instead of the source cluster. Uh, and there are some things to be careful of here because kubeconfigs are actually, in my opinion, like super complicated and there should probably be multiple objects there. Uh, and you have to be very careful when you are executing them with the Kubernetes client libraries. Uh, you have to sanitize these things. There are some recommendations in the proposal that's linked at the end. And um, we actually had a CVE, or we, we published a CVE because we knew that we had this problem and we just fixed it this month. Uh, so that the CVE is, you know, from this month, and it's improper kubeconfig validation allows arbitrary code execution. 
Um, something to watch out for if you're extending Kubernetes in this way and need access to another cluster. Say if you were like writing a service mesh or a multi-cluster network policy controller, there's a lot of things you could think of where the objects get kind of complicated and you're also doing things in multiple clusters. Uh, watch out for that. Now, um, the last bit is really building on top of these ideas. Okay, so we kind of recognize now, maybe we don't want to use service accounts literally, but we want our own sort of service user that's very particular for the objects that our controller is reconciling, right? You want a specific context. Now, once we have all of these objects constrained within each other, or within itself, we want to also be thinking about policy between the objects, right? Remember how when we were applying the config, we were working in multiple namespaces, applying config to multiple namespaces? Well, so let's look at this example. We have a webhook, a source, and an apply in a management namespace. And then now that's going to go and maybe make some configs and secrets and a bunch of other objects in the cluster, maybe in a bunch of namespaces. That's fine. We've talked about all of this. Now, you'll notice that the source and the apply object, they're describing, the, say, in this example, the Git repository and then a customized build, right? And it's going to apply that to the cluster. Now, doesn't necessarily mean like when we're collaborating with our team that the same people who apply, who manage sources are also the same people who manage the way that configuration is applied to the cluster. Right? Or maybe you just want to be organized a little bit differently. And so if the applier resource is potentially in a different namespace than the source resource, now you want to start referencing these things across namespaces. Other objects that do this in Kubernetes are cluster role binding. Cluster role binding can reference namespaces in, uh, or service accounts in different namespaces. Also, if you look at ingress controllers, uh, this pattern is inspired by Contour. Uh, Contour has uh, a technique called HTTP route inclusion. Uh, it used to be called ingress route delegation. Uh, it's a way of specifying and enforcing policies across namespaces and referencing objects across namespaces. And so if you give a controller the ability to do that, then when someone says in their apply resource, oh, I want to use a Git repo from some namespace, how do you know that the person who made that apply resource and then the context of that source code, actually that those things have access to each other? And if you look at some of the things that are happening in multi-cluster networking right now, uh, something that people are starting to reach for is ACLs. Um, the thing that I want to encourage here, uh, this is a simpler um, version of that previous picture where the source and the apply are in different namespaces and they're referencing each other, is to say on the source resource, which is being referenced from outside of the namespace, maybe we can put an access control list. Right? So, Maybe when the controller is, uh, the apply controller is looking through, it can go and look in the source object and see, am I allowed to actually access that, that thing? This is a really simple way to implement this. It's a little bit problematic from a permissions and policy perspective, uh, but very easy to work with, super good UX. You know, the person authoring the source object can just be like, hey, I don't want this thing to be used outside of these namespaces. You know, just list it. Problem is that, that that needs to be obeyed by the client that's actually reading the source object. By that point, you've already looked at all the fields. And so the way that I want to encourage that this is done is the very basic thing is that we, we keep using user impersonation, right? If we know that the apply controller is going to drop privileges to an impersonated user, then we can actually create role bindings in the repository management namespace that give access to other namespaces. Uh, some folks maybe don't know that that's how RBAC can be used, but if you want to give access to somebody in a different namespace, you roll bind to that service account across namespaces just using normal Kubernetes. And this is really good, and if you want to then implement the ACLs this way, you can give source controller, right, the thing that manages the source object, the ability to create a role binding on behalf of that access control list. That will open up that access for you with a really simple UX. And the reason why, even though this may seem a little bit more complicated, it's, in my opinion, the best thing to do is you're using the API server as the policy engine, right? You're using it as the authorizer for this access control list. So we only write our controllers, we drop our privileges when we need to. And then if we want to implement an ACL, 
we actually go and make that role binding and now the authorizer is outside of any of the code that we've written. That means that if the apply controller in another namespace wants to access the source in a namespace that it doesn't have access to, the issue that it's going to get when it tries to get that source is from the API server saying you don't have access to that. And this has another benefit, which is that now if you do it this way, because remember, GitOps is, a, is about people collaborating with each other with our tools. It's not about stuff that's happening inside a cluster configuration. We make these multi-tenant multi APIs so that people can work together effectively, so people can know each other's identity, so that people can uh, have access to repositories that are only affecting the things that they need. And so then there's the, all these usability issues of like, you know, you're in kubectl, doing kubectl auth, can I? You're trying to figure out what does this person have has access to? Well, you can build higher level tools on this primitive because the command line libraries can see, oh, do you have access to the, that thing? And you don't actually have to get the object because it's just our back. I'll show you. Yeah. This is just too much explaining. Just, let's just demo it. kubectl auth. Can I get, you know, a service? And, um, you know, or let's just even just uh, get list. All right, so it's like all of the information about what this very restricted service count can do, right? You can see that you have um, the create verbs. Uh, oh, no, sorry, this is the admin service account. I can create anything, right? I can do the, um, the discovery APIs, and then I can hit all of these endpoints here. Right, so there's a bunch of health endpoints in Kubernetes. And then if I drop privileges, uh, then I can only, I, I lose the, the star star access there. And um, so if the, if what you can access is always available, right, it, it tells you, uh, the Kubernetes API server tells you what you have and don't have access to, you don't need to do anything insecure in order to figure out what your access control list is. You, know, you can literally just ask kubectl off, can I? There is a flag here, all namespaces. Uh, where you can run that on a particular resource or API group and then get the full list of what Git repositories you have access to or that sort of thing. And that can, again, be applicable to whenever you're building a complex API and you have these multi-tenant needs. And so in kind of conclusion, this is the uh, link to the proposal. Uh, go ahead and just check that out. Uh, the kind of the whole, oh, I didn't mean to click that. There we go. The whole kind of point of what I'm getting at here is that um, I think right now, open policy agent, Caverno, it's getting super popular. You know, we're like, oh, I want to make a bunch of ingresses and I want to build like external DNS and I want to use all of these monitoring APIs and I'm struggling. I'm, I, my, my developers, they can't even log into the cluster, right? There's no like identity. Right. I'm just trying to bolt all of these things together to build a platform on Kubernetes. I'm trying to do the platform building platform thing. And it's because we're reaching for these policy agents. We're starting to write these things. We're using a mutation, mutating policy admission controller in, in between the requests to every single thing to the API server because we cannot trust our extensions. Right. Our extensions have complicated APIs, but they don't have an understanding of how to drop privileges when we want to give access to the people that need to do the thing with the extension. And if you want to look at this proposal and kind of get a better idea of how you can use user impersonation to drop privileges and how you can then use it as a primitive to build access control lists with your multi-object APIs, even across namespaces, which is something that traditionally extensions really suck at, uh, then we can build better tools. We can collaborate with each other and it's just gonna be like a less sucky time. I mean, this is just miserable, you know? So come talk to me. I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, especially if you were able to connect or learn something from the presentation, let me know. And uh, hit me up on Twitter and GitHub. Cheers. <laughs>